Welcome to the Equipping Leaders podcast, Leader Study Series. I'm Natasha, a leader development professional, and I would say that leadership is my passion. I love leading and supporting leaders in their leadership journey. And I'm Corey, a program manager, emerging leader, and overall leadership enthusiast. In this Leader Study Series, we're going through the seven episodes of the 2011 sci-fi show, Terra Nova. For each episode, we will deconstruct the leaders and decisions of the characters on the show. Leadership is demonstrated in many different ways, and we're looking forward to talking about the actions, responses, and opportunities to show up as a leader. Terra Nova aired in 2011, so there will be spoilers in these episodes. Throughout the episodes, we'll talk about emotional intelligence, difficult conversations, building and maintaining trust, and more. Let's jump in. Okay, we are back and we are starting a new series. This series is going to talk about the television show uh, Terra Nova, which was on sci-fi. Unfortunately, it's only seven episodes long, one season, but there were a lot of different interesting leadership and interpersonal and team dynamics throughout those seven episodes. So basically, just a quick overview, the world that we know is on the verge of environmental collapse. And so certain people who are either selected because of their skills or selected through a lottery get this opportunity to go to the past to create a better future. And the group that we're focusing on is this family who they got in trouble with the law because they had a third child when the law dictates that you can only have two. But now, thanks to the wife and her skills as a medical professional, the family has the opportunity to go to Terra Nova. There's other nuance and stuff in there and throughout, but if that if we work that out as we talk about some of the different characters and situations, then we'll let it come up organically. But yeah, so I know this is also your first time watching the show. So as you started to watch it, what were some of the first leadership pieces that stood out to you? So one thing real quick, just from a sci-fi nerd perspective, it is important that this is an alternate time stream past, right? So there's no butterfly effect type stuff that's going to take place. Okay, I just, I needed to, whew, got to, had to get that out, baseline that. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, like you said, I never watched the show before. So um, the only reason I started watching it is because, you know, we had talked about looking at this from a leadership perspective. So I went into it immediately looking for the leadership stuff, um, which was uh, quite a bit different than how I normally casually watch, you know, t- binge watch TV and movies and stuff. Um and what I thought was interesting, one of the first things that stuck out to me was, um, you know, this was filmed way before COVID was a thing, but because, you know, this is like a failing planet and uh, the air quality is bad and there's like not a lot of oxygen, they all had on like respirators and face masks and stuff like that. And I was like, oh God, it's COVID, right? And there was guards walking around and people scanning everything. And I was like, oh God, it's, you know, this is like PTSD inducing. Um, so what I thought was interesting with that is it from a leadership perspective is now you kind of have like these different organizations. You have like this federal government organization, right? With the, you know, uh, a family is four, right? Flashes up on this billboard of like, you can only have two children. Um, And then you, it's kind of like futuristic sci-fi cyber punk city, Um, all these billboards flashing up with all these different rules. And then you have all these different companies offering sort of these like, you know, buy air here um, uh, and things like that. And I just thought it was interesting because navigating, it was uh, sensory overload as a viewer watching the TV show. So it was like this sensory overload of data and information. And you, like you had kind of alluded to, you had, um, you know, Jim and Elizabeth, right? Two of the kind of main titular characters. They're now trying to navigate through. We had, you know, uh, we have these three kids, right? So we have this large group of people. We need to get them back to uh, the past. You need to go through that. So just sort of like that that information overload of a lot of different nodes of, of information coming in and trying to stay focused. I know that was a little muddy, but like it really did stick out to me in the beginning there. It's just like, wow, there's a lot going on here. How are you supposed to focus on anything? Mm, I like that. I know for me, the first thing, I mean, yes, there's a lot in the first kind of little bit of the show there. I think that the first time 
that I watch the leadership piece emerge is once they've gotten to Terra Nova and they meet Commander Nathaniel Taylor. So he is essentially the leader of Terra Nova. And when they first encounter him, he gives this welcome speech that I thought was great uh, because he has this great humor in it, but also it's motivating to what it was that they were trying to do there. So, and we've talked about this in other series where that vision, that focus, and that what it is that we're trying to do, even if it's at this 30,000 foot view, he instilled that right away, but he did it in this way that made him approachable and engaging, but also like, we're going to change the world, right? We're going to make this better future. It also wasn't long-winded. Sometimes people, when they are in those types of positions, they have a captive audience, uh, as in they are your captives. They are not captivated. <laughs> they are your captives and they'll go on forever. And I've definitely seen that in real life too, where you're like, unfortunately, whatever you said that was going to be smart or engaging is lost because this is too long. You've gone on for way too long. So I really liked that it was not long-winded and that there was no unnecessary filler there. I can't help but feel personally attacked over that comment. But uh, yeah, no, that that stuck out to me uh, as well. I think the other thing, too, was the um, the follow up conversation that he had with that. Right. Because as we know, um, you know, Jim is technically supposed to be in prison um, and there was only supposed to be four, not three of them that are four, not five, excuse me, of them that came. And I think he handled that really well. You know what I mean? He gave his his opening speech. They were, uh, you know, um, all those that that the new folks that came in. They were all treated as equal in the sense that it wasn't like called out like we have a, a criminal and a stowaway type situation. Gave the speech. Everything's good. Somebody comes up afterwards says, hey, Taylor wants to talk to you. Right. Um, sort of like offline. And I think that that he didn't let that kind of uh, hiccup get in the way of, of what the process was and what the goal was, right. Of getting everyone integrated in, he took that offline, didn't really worry everyone else about it um, and treated it as a private matter, which I thought was, that was also really wise because he, he could have had the opportunity there to be like, we have these stowaways, you know, that kind of thing. So I yeah. thought that was interesting too. And he had a really great line there too, when he said, you know, I don't care about laws from another time. What I do care about is if a person is of use to this colony. Exactly. And I think that that's also such a great leadership quality where it's like, that was a different team in this instance, that was a different time. But now here, this is what we need. Can you meet that? And I think the gym does a really good job of accepts like this role of gardener maintenance person, right? Just to be like, I understand that I need to, like, I have. You know, in the previous place, I was in prison here. I am technically not supposed to be here. Uh, however, I want to. It's good for my family. It's good for all these other things. What do I need to do to show that I can be of value to this? So just understanding that you have to show that value sometimes. And you and I've talked about this before, so I'd love to hear uh, more of your perspective on this. But oftentimes people leave a long career in a certain industry and then they step into a new industry and they have this weird expectation of it's not that you have to start over, but you do have to accept that it's different and that it's new and that the value that you had in something previously is not necessarily as valued in this new place. Valued there? That's great. Not valued here or not valued as highly. That can make people feel a certain way. Yeah, I. that's exactly because the other thing you know I was thinking about is as he's on that team, he said like, Hey, look, I used to be, you know, a cop. There's got to be bad guys here. You need me to catch them. Right. He, he talks about that sort of thing, you know, too, as well. And I think what's so interesting is commander Taylor. It, he listens, right. He, he, I, he listens to, you know, what uh, um, Jim wants to do. Uh, you know, he, he hears that out and, and kind of like you said, he said, we need a gardener, right? And and really what that came down to is physical physical labor, right? You need a strong, fit person to go do this thing. And also, you know, he said it without saying it, we have scientists, right? We have people like that, right? Those are the folks that are doing those high-level jobs. I've He pulls up the files for, you know, 
um, Jim and for uh, Elizabeth and talks through Elizabeth's accolades as, you know, a medical professional and everything. So he's just saying like, hey, you're now part of this organization. We're going to have you. But like, this is where you're going to contribute because so it's just because he stowed away and, and snuck over to Terra Nova doesn't mean that everything's going to change for him. So I, you know, we talk a lot, like you'd said, about joining a new organization and sort of coming with these expectations of the old organization. But I never really thought about the other the other side of that is sometimes when you I think bring on a new team member into a team, you know, you're hiring them most of the time off a resume and an interview, which is sort of um kind of like the interviewees they they have the not the upper hand, but right, you, all you have is proof is their resume. So they kind of say whatever they want and it's not till they get there and attempt to execute. So I think that expectation management on both sides, just because somebody has all these great list of accolades doesn't mean they're going to be the end all fix all for, for your problem on the team. So yeah, I think that was really interesting. And speaking of Jim kind of pointing out like the experience that he did have, we then also get to learn that, yeah, the Terra Nova does have problems. So people are selected to come there. They come in smaller groups, right? So that it can be more integrated, more controlled. They need different resources there because the air is fresher. You know, they just need different support. So they come in smaller groups. But this is where we kind of learn about this. There's a thief in the infirmary where Elizabeth works. And then we also learn about the sixes. And what I and so the sixes are a group of people who are uh, just in conflict with the rest of Terra Nova. I'll, I'll say it like that. But what I appreciate about that is that they did. They built Terra Nova in this very smart and very controlled way. And so just like in real life, you can work so hard to create the perfect environment, but you can't control people. And so one person's idea of this like great environment or this great mission, other people may not think that's the best way to do it or think that's the best idea. So I thought that that was just so interesting where it's like, and of course it's a TV show and in the media, you know, you have to have the good guys and the bad guys. But I think it's just like, it's just two people who are like, we don't think I think it should be this way. And I think it should be this way. And those ways aren't the same. And so I thought that that was really interesting to see brought up immediately. Yeah. So I've only, like I said, I've only watched the first episode. And as the sixes were introduced, you know, you, you get, you don't, I haven't gotten their side of the story yet. Right. So to speak. Um, And what I think is so interesting too, is when, Commander Taylor is kind of describing because they they seem like a terrorist organization, right? To to me, right now, um, they've come in, they tried to ram the gate, they're you know taking hostages, trying to uh, get medicine. So they don't, they they seem counter, right, to the culture. They seem counter to what is going to be successful here because I think we talk. There's freaking dinosaurs, right, like running around too. So it's like not like a super safe place just in general, right? Within the environment. Like you don't really need bad guys when you got like a T-Rex running around. Um, I haven't seen T-Rexes yet, but I'm hoping. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, but when Commander Taylor's sort of explaining to Jim, cause he's like, hey, what's going on, right? You're telling me there's this is all sunshine and rainbows and I'm seeing these people. I, Commander Taylor never badmouths them, really, right? right. He He says, this is a group of people. They showed up, right? They seemed like they were getting along with everything. Um, all of a sudden, they they weren't, right? They took some supplies and stuff and left and started their own place. He didn't do anything about that, right? He didn't hunt them down. He accepted this isn't the right place for them. You know what I mean? He yeah. still holds them accountable to the law, as it were, right? Like, don't steal our stuff. But, you know, he gave them plenty of medicine. And, and in fact, the only thing he said was, hey, you know, we don't want, we want to make sure that we're not in low supply, giving them, you know, all of our medicine. So just, you know, settle down a little bit with how much you're donating, but I, he's being very reasonable in my opinion. And and I thought that that shows a lot of strength because this is the world that he created, so to speak. And these people said, I don't like it. And he doesn't, okay. He's, he accepts that, right? I think that's a very strong uh, character uh, point. Yes. Well, and because people have choice and you have to give them the space to make that choice and you hope that they want to be on your team, but not everybody does. 
And the other thing that I, I really like about what you said there too, as far as like him sharing supplies, they don't have access to get any supplies. Yeah. At Terra Nova, right? Like they bring in these groups, like the supplies come in with the groups. Who has access to that? Terra Nova does and no one else. So I think there is amount an amount of, I understand what this is, right? From, from Commander Taylor. I understand that, you know, you don't have this kind of access. You don't have these other things. I'm willing to, you know, give you certain supplies. Now, I'm not willing to give you supplies that could then be used against us because he doesn't agree to give them like ammo or weapons, but yeah. he does agree to be like, no, but you do, you should be safe. You should be healthy. Yeah, no, I, it, that's a great point too. He, he could not starve them out, right? Uh, but like uh, he, could, he, could, he could sweat them out, you know, so like you said, right? With, with the lack of supplies and stuff. So it's, I think it's like a humanitarian aspect of of being a good human and these people don't share my viewpoint but they're still humans we still want to be successful and survive here so give them that medicine and it's and in this interaction too we meet mira and so mira is essentially the leader of the sixes of this opposing group we'll call them and in their interaction when she's trying to get back their guy so they had the person in the infirmary carter and once, you know, he kind of breaks out of there and causes some chaos, Commander Taylor puts him in the brig and then she's there also to try to get him back. And so what I thought was really interesting, too, was everything's heightening around them. People are starting to just yell. People are starting to just chaos is about to rule. But two leaders, even on opposing sides, they had this like they looked at each other and just kind of had the silent agreement like via eye contact and no words that then they told everybody to stand down and not to get spun up. Right. So it was almost like neither one of us want this. And we're both strong enough leaders to say, like, we can talk about this. We'll compromise. We'll figure out something so that this doesn't become a bigger thing and people get hurt. Supplies get ruined, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So I thought that that moment of that eye contact between the two of them was pretty cool. Yeah, I, I'm reminded, I think it was you, you know, talking about kind of like one of those things where, um, you know, it's it's like the good nature to go in to just trust somebody, right? Because they've mm -hmm. done nothing to prove their interest. But then if something's done to break that trust, it's difficult to build that trust back up, right? Um, it's not impossible. It just, you know, can take time depending on the people in the situation. And I, I think it's so interesting that both of them were mature especially the sixes as the sort of outside organization uh this has been going on for a while apparently and and she was smart enough as the leader to realize it's best it's in the best not to they can have that eye contact right so she hasn't tried to break that trust in the past and i think that that's again when you you look at like leadership and maturity that's a that's sometimes difficult to do right because yeah. She, she saw the long-term benefit of maintaining that versus, you know, maybe there was an opportunity in the past where she could have said one thing and done the other um, for kind of a short-term victory, but had no long-term lasting benefit. So, yeah, that was good. I, I so, so one of the other things, one of the big things that did stick out to me is, again, looking at this strictly through like a leadership lens is... Um, Jim went went away to prison. He was in prison for several years. Um, he has that family. So if we kind of take out that family aspect of it and um, just look at it as he was sort of the leader in the the family, right? Um, he, he was a cop. He was just sort of that kind of uh, attitude or leader. He, when he went away to jail, um, when he came back, uh, it, one of the kids was super young, barely remembered him. Um, and then he had sort of an older son and, and daughter. The the oldest son kind of struggled a little bit to um, really communicate and adapt with him. And the dad was sort of confused. And I think it's funny that, you know, you talk about you leave an organization and go back as a teammate and expect nothing to have changed. Right. Or um, and as somebody myself who's a re repeat offender, sometimes of certain organizations, certain overarch, the, either whom I work for directly or. Um, sort of the environment in which I work in, right? The community. Sometimes I leave one community and then go back to that community. Um, I I can get caught up in that, right? 
was, had a great rapport, had a great network built up, but, and then I left and come back, and those people have moved on and filled the gap or or something like that. And that's been that was a hard learned lesson that you know it, life will go on type thing. And mm -hmm. he's really struggling with that, and I think that's really interesting. Yeah, we see both the father and the son struggling with, like you said, Jim wanting to be like, you know, I'm back. It's fine. Yeah. Right? Like we can just keep moving. Nothing forward. ever happened. Yeah. Right. Yep. And then, you know, you have the other side who's like, I want to acknowledge what happened. I want to acknowledge these different things. And so I think that also goes to how different people cope with things. Some people don't want to address it, not because they aren't able to, sometimes they aren't able to, but sometimes they just don't want to address it because that's how they move on. But other people really need to talk through things. So kind of also understanding what the other people on your team need and understanding that they're not coming from a place of trying to mess up the team or mess with you or anything like that. I think there's a moment when Jim and Elizabeth are talking where Jim's like, I don't know what to do. And she says, he really missed you, right? So his behavior isn't saying that right now. But this is the result of him feeling that way for the whole time you were gone. Yeah, I I often find myself in the what's done is done, right? Let's just forget about it. At, you know, avoid the confrontation, avoid talking about it, because can't, you know, can't change the past and why waste the time? You know, unpack it at home by yourself, right? Like Boop, do that over there if we're gonna just keep working not right and, and and you know it's something i had to actively sort of think about and i think you know as i'm as i mature and as i i progress within my um sort of my professional career it's like one of those things i gotta be very conscious of as change happens right so cut teams grow and shrink cut contracts come and go you know or work if you will work comes and goes and so it's just like that's difficult for me. And I also think it's it's hard to make sure I don't like set that standard, if you will. Like I, I don't want I don't want people on my team to know that, that that's the way I feel. It's just deal with it, deal with it at home type thing, right? We don't need to talk about it. Because I don't want to set that as the norm because that's not how everyone deals with it. So I don't know. It's one of those things where it's like, I guess I gotta bother you more about how do I actively make sure that I'm not doing that. Well, I think I was just talking with a couple of people about this yesterday, actually, where be, okay, this is such a cliche thing to say, but being uncomfortable or being comfortable, being uncomfortable, <laughs> but easier said than done because nobody wants to be uncomfortable. And our brains are literally wired to protect us from that type of thing. because so our brain doesn't know if this is an uncomfortable situation or a bear attack. Right. So it's going to do what it needs to do to protect us. So, yes, yeah, so I think with those types of things. When we can really listen to someone else and just let something land on you and don't you don't have to do anything about it in that moment. Right. Like something is going on and somebody has a lot of feelings around it, giving them that space to talk it out with you and just let them know, like, I'm here to listen I can't offer any solutions right now because I'd need more time to process this or I want to think about it more, but tell me everything that you're thinking or everything that you're feeling. You're not going to like, I'm not going to be upset about it. Your feelings are, you know, are, are yours. So I just, but I want to hear so I can better understand and empathize with where you're coming from. And so even if people can kind of like set that up, especially leaders, but anybody on a team can set that up and then really like, Make that space for people. Because sometimes when people are like, well, you left and you did this and you did this, people then want to be like, oh, okay, but like, but like, let me just jump in here and like tell you why, right? So there's all this like justification when you have somebody who's accusing and somebody who's attempting to justify, nobody's listening. So instead of just make that space and then when they're finished, like, thank you for that feedback. Thank you for that input. I'm going to think about this and I'd like to come back and talk about it some more. Uh, you know, so, and again, not trying to come back like a lawyer, be like, well, you said this, and then this is the truth. Instead, just to be like, I, I heard all of that. And, uh, you know, maybe even an apology is in order. You know, I didn't mean to hurt you, but I did. I hurt you. And this is the way that I hurt you. 
And moving forward, I'm going to be mindful in these ways so that I don't do that again. But I appreciate you letting me know that that is what had happened. So just like things like that, which I know sometimes they, even that can feel so awkward if you're not used to it or anything like that. But it's just a matter of like what's genuine and what's also not like I acknowledge your feelings, right? <laughs> like you don't because then oh, I shouldn't tell say you like things. That. <laughs> notes here real quick <laughs> so you know it's just that like kind of that that i mean just that genuine authentic let me just really listen i'm not going to do anything with the information except let it land and then i'll process it later but tell me how you feel yeah the good advice right that's the only reason i do these podcasts <laughs> selfishly is i get good advice um but uh um yeah i because with that, what I think is interesting, Jim, I don't think does that, at least not yet to me. He doesn't do that. He's just like, we'll forget about it. It was what it was. You know, I, I also think like he tries to justify it away, right? Well, like I did it to protect your sister and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So he tries to, you know, you're, you don't understand kid sport champ. It's, you know, that kind of thing. But what I, the other thing I think is interesting is the ramifications of that, in my opinion, are you see that first day or that first weekday, whatever, there's the orientation for the new people coming in. So, you know, um, uh, Elizabeth is doing her medical thing, right? You have Jim is going and doing the farmer thing. And then Josh is supposed to be, uh, and everybody else is supposed to be doing the, the orientation for like the kiddos. Um, and Josh ends up there's a uh, another person there roughly his age right that strikes up the conversation he's going to skip the orientation to to go hang out with this person right so he's, he's making an emotional connection with someone jim runs into him what are you doing this isn't how you start like a new thing totally alienates josh even more right doesn't doesn't handle it well and what i think is like interesting of that is you gave jim gave josh sort of like the in his brain gave him all the currency he needs to 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 spend on bad decisions so skipping the orientation what could have been something small now leads to breaking outside of the gate but you know where there's dinosaurs uh you know things like that so i that just was like super one interaction and the whole rest of that I don't know what point that is. Call it a half hour, right? We're a half hour into the episode. One bad interaction, the next hour and a half of just sheer turmoil in that show, I can trace it all back to that mishandling of a situation. I like several things you said there. So what I had to write it down, you gave him the currency to spend on bad decisions. That's such a, that's so good. <laughs> um, but also... Okay, so kind of going back to a little bit of what we were talking about before and then leading into this where, you know, he had that whole like, you don't understand kid, I was doing it for, you know, your sister for the family, all of that. I think that sometimes that's another reason why that like listening piece is so important, because like, of course, we did something for a reason. And somebody else feels a certain way for a reason. And both of those things can be simultaneously true. And like, the fact that one person did something doesn't make the other person's experience less valid, right? So yes, he was doing something to protect the family that he thought was the right thing. And Josh still felt like he was abandoned for those three years. And both of those things are 100% true. Yep. And so that's the other reason why like sometimes we're like, oh, well, let me defend this. You could defend with any words you want. It's just, it's not going to work. And yeah, the uh, because he also hadn't rebuilt that relationship. I mean, most things are relationship based, right? So because he hadn't rebuilt that relationship with Josh yet, you're right. He, uh, like you said, gave him the currency to spend on bad decisions in one interaction because you haven't acknowledged, like he didn't acknowledge Josh's experience. He didn't acknowledge Josh at all. He, he had this expectation that things would go back to normal. And now not only is he telling him what to do, he's telling it him what to do in front of one of Josh's peers. So that like public thing too can make people feel humiliated, can make people feel shame. And what are they going to do? They're going to rally, right? They're going to rally, not behind you. They're going to rally against you. And you're right. That's exactly what, uh, that is exactly what happened next. 
and not 24 hours ago, similar situation, but you had Commander Taylor who did not do that, right? He didn't belittle Jim I, in front of Jim's peers. He yeah. pulled him aside and, you know, had that conversation. So I yeah. think that's also, uh, I won't say good leader and bad leader. I, I will say uh, been a leader a while and maybe a brand new leader. You know what I mean? That's one mm -hmm. of those marked sort of differences. A, a subtle nuance creates an hour and a half worth of more television. <laughs> and yeah, just like leader maturity is a very real thing. And sometimes I, I hear that phrase talked around a lot, professional maturity, leader maturity. And that's exactly like you just highlighted that so well with those two examples where Jim has a lot of great professional experience and that's awesome. And he has certain skills that are really great. And then there's this other piece. And maybe again, it's the type of relationships that we build. So every relationship is different. But also to view these things as it's like these are like these interactions. Every time you talk to somebody, you are building or destroying the relationship that you have with them. So do you when you get to certain places, do you have to use your phrase? Do you have the currency currently built up? Do you have that much in savings to be able to say things, ask questions so that they know that you're coming from a place of kindness and care? versus them feeling, you know, oppressed and not listened to. Yeah. No, that's Yeah. Make, yeah. yeah. Make it, yeah, the the oppression piece too. I you think that's that's big cuz again, depending on how uh Commander Taylor would have handled that initial meeting and understanding of of third child uh escaped convict coming to his you know, supposed utopia where there, yes, there's a lottery, but for the most part, you know, you got to have somebody to to cut the vines off the the fence, as it were. Um, building up with like really smart people, and he could have handled that much more poorly and given the Sixers five new bodies, you know, uh, so to speak. So yeah, it's just very interesting. So now the. Josh and his new friend Sky, and then a group That's of her name, Sky. teenagers. <laughs> a group of uh teen young adults about the same age. They are they decide to sneak outside the gate. You could tell this is something that they do frequently. They know where they're going. They have teenage uh shenanigans stuff out in the, you know, out in certain places. But then it comes to a point where it's getting too late. And they need to try to get back. But the Sixes have taken part of the vehicle that they had. So now they're stuck. And when they're stuck outside the gate and they're under attack from these slashers, Sky goes into this incredible leadership mode where she's pointing out people's knowledge and strengths to get them to do something instead of panic. And she forms this plan to keep them safe. What is this? Where is this? You can do this. You've got this. Like just this, like she just took such great command of the situation that in, in a panic and some of the people were panicking. Some of the people in their panic made some very poor choices. However, she just remained calm and aware of what was going on around her. So she was listening, not only with her ears, but listening, you know, with her eyes, listening with sensing what was going on this in the environment having this really great emotional intelligence. And then also understanding that Josh, this is his first time outside the gate, first time interacting or, you know, being under attack by a dinosaur of any kind, which is such a crazy thing to say. But, uh, but in all that, she took all of that information in. And this is kind of where I wanted to bring this piece up here too, especially with what you just said, where it's like you have Commander Taylor, obviously been a leader for a long time. You have Jim, obviously been in positions where leadership was needed to be shown. Sky, who does not have any of that experience, but showed this incredible leader maturity in this very serious moment. Yeah, no, I I can't agree more. Um, especially hold on, let me make a note because there's something I wanted to talk about between what we just talked about and this, but I don't want to break the uh making for riveting podcasting. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> just gotta make notes for myself. Um uh so yeah, I the thing that really stuck out to me there too, like you'd said, is the calling out of people's skills, and that was both done 
as a comfort to that individual as well as a comfort to the group overall. So it was one, here's your role. You are you are valued because you do this, but doing that publicly also let the rest of the team um they understood where they fit in, right? Where's the where's the stop and the start of their roles and responsibilities? And also now as a team member, I'm seeing all of the resources here that puts me more at ease because not only now do I understand it, I know that Sky, right, who's our little leader at this point, that sounded derogatory. I meant like the micro leader in the situation, excuse me, is, um, uh, I know that she knows what all of that is too, right? So now I can move effectively. I know in her brain, she's looking at all these different parts. And that was just like, yeah, that was, that was like, rock star level status of, of you know leadership stuff yeah um i thought that was great and it also gave everyone because they're there for a while right they're stuck in that little jeep humby thing it, it I, i'm now aware of everyone's strengths right I, I also and we've talked about that and we've also talked about like where my fear is on some of that stuff now i can help her as a leader um i as just a team member i can leverage those people you're great at that, right? Like, don't worry, you're doing that. Remember, so and so is doing that, right? So don't, you shouldn't have to worry about that. So that was, yeah, it was just hugely, that was, yeah. And like you said, some people also that whole, like, you can lead a horse to water. I thought it was very clear. I thought the plan made sense. I thought the danger of the dinosaurs was uh, apparent. Some people, they had their biases. They knew what was going on. They made their own choice. And I, you know, nothing you could do about that. Now that was sort of a, a, a life or death situation as well. So I think that there was a bit more aggression into you probably shouldn't do that, like stop. But at the end of the day, there's not much you can do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What was the thing before this you wanted to mention? So, uh, but when, they, so they, like you'd said, they break out of the camp and everything, they go into the swimming whole thing, they land, they come out of the water, and there's all these like carvings and stuff on the rocks, like the math or looks like looks like alien uh, writing. And Josh says to Sky, like, oh, did you tell Commander Taylor about this? And they're super fascinating. And she was like, no, he's not even supposed to know we're out here. And I was just thinking about like. Um, uh, like the workplace, like work culture, like safety concept. And I, it might've been cause I was just doing some government mandated training, but it was like, I view commander Taylor as being like a pretty, uh, my whole, you know, interaction with him so far, upstanding dude seems pretty understanding, pre- seems pretty fair. Um, and she, he'll kill us, right? Like he'd kill us. And a little bit of that was, you know, over dramatizing, right? Like if he found out that we broke out of the gate, but they have this potentially big piece of information, big piece of a puzzle, something that's very important. And they're not sharing it because they broke the rules to get there. And it's like, but you know, why, why wouldn't they, why wouldn't they say that? Right. You you can acknowledge, Hey, I did something I wasn't supposed to do, but I found this anyway. Um, So I just thought that that was, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Do you get what I'm trying to say, though? Yes. No, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, because I'm also thinking, I'm also in my mind, just flashing forward to the end of the episode when Taylor's like, did you go near the waterfalls? He yes. knows something's there. But does he know what she knows? And so that's where it kind of goes back to what you're saying. Like, is it really just off limits because it's slasher territory? Or is it off limits because of something else, right? Yes. But you're right. It's There's not that safety of, can I tell you, about this thing that I found. And I I feel the same way you do, where I feel like you could just go to Commander Taylor and be like, could I have amnesty for a decision I made? Yeah. <laughs> but also I have information I really like to tell you. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's again, that it goes to psychological safety. And is that created? If I make a mistake or if I do something, but it's something that could potentially impact the group, do I feel like I can say it to my leader or to someone else in the organization? Um, so yeah, I think that that was super interesting because again, we don't know if Taylor knows, we know that Sky knows and now these other kids know, but that's all we know. Yeah, no, that was, like I said, that was the big thing too, because I, then you see the amount of people, right. Cause they're like, like we talked about slashers type of dinosaur. Um, but like, uh, 
a lot of resources are expended to get out there to save them, right? Because they, they made a bad choice to go swimming and, you know, eat dragon fruit uh, or whatever, right? Could have easily done that back in the camp. It's gorgeous there. But anyway, um, they actively made that choice. And a lot of resources, limited resources, had to be expended to protect them and to save them and get them back. Mm-hmm. And and that because no matter what, Commander Taylor was going to do that to, to save those people. Makes sense to me. Same thing within like a normal business organization, right? You're going to try to make sure your people are taken care of. Um, but uh, we talk about that sort of um, psychological safety and everything. I, they should have been able to go to Commander Taylor for that. But I also think like they should have accepted that there was going to be ramifications still for those actions, right? Because we now have evidence of all that is spent to do that which is why we have this rule in place so you know i'm not saying they should have been you know kicked out of the camp altogether but it's like i think that a lot of times people it's not punishment but it's like you know what i mean it's just weird that there's sometimes there has to be ramifications for the actions so what do you mean by ramifications maybe that's not the right word but like that consequences you know, but yeah consequences, what, kind yeah, of, yeah. what kind of consequences i i don't know right i don't know what they should be but i i, I don't know i feel like there should be some uh, or i don't know if the fear is enough like the fact that they had to go through the experience is enough and again i think maybe being chased and pinned down by by dinosaurs is a bit extreme but uh yeah i don't know I, I only ask more questions because uh, I think that's such an interesting concept. Uh, this whole, like, I, as the leader, have to enforce punishment. I'm part of a punitive process. When, why is it a punitive process? Yeah. Why do I have to punish anybody? Why does somebody has to learn by suffering? Like, that's wild to me. Uh, so I thought that the way Commander Taylor handled it was actually great because he pulled together the resources to go after those kids because they're part of the team and people make mistakes. And sometimes those mistakes endanger other people's jobs or other people in the organization, but it's a mistake, right? Now, if they continue to do this and they continue to endanger, it's not even that somebody needs to be punished or have something, you know, adverse happen to them. It's more of a like, okay, so now you're actually continuing to endanger. You haven't learned this lesson there's nothing else I can do for you, right? So then there's just a, I can't expend resources on you anymore. And then typically those people would like leave an organization um, or be, you know, performance managed out. But yeah, I, I just think that, yeah, there I don't, these are adults who are aware. They know they've yeah. made a mistake, right? So when it comes to like that next thing, it's just like, hey, uh, there's a story. I don't remember what, what the company was but somebody, he made some mistake and it cost the company, you know, 10, $15 million. And when he went in to talk to the boss, he was so sure he was about to get fired or, you know, get in trouble. And when he went in, the leader just said, Hey, you know, what did you learn from this? And, you know, he said, Oh, I learned these different things, you know, still ready for that other shoe to drop. And he said, great. So like lean on that learning and don't let this happen again. And that was it. That was the whole thing. Right. And it was it wasn't held against him later. It wasn't like, don't give him these accounts because he'll lose all this money. It was just that. Did you learn something from it? Maybe if he'd come in with a different perspective and been like, I didn't learn anything. (laughs) Or, you know, it was like just a shallow, like just trying to make something up in the moment. Maybe it would have been a different outcome where it's like, oh, yeah, this isn't working. But yeah, I, I just think that when you have people in an organization and there's a punitive system in place, it's just a mechanism of trying to control people. And you're not actually part of a workplace or part of a community. You're part of a prison system. And so that's why I just tend to be like, either keep them or release them, but it's not for you to dole out punishments as an organization or as a leader. Hot take. (laughs) No, I, uh, I don't disagree. I guess it's, I, What's what's the difference between making a mistake and actively doing something you know is wrong? Because I don't view them leaving the the I don't view them leaving the camp as a mistake, right? If they were, I don't know, if they dropped all the dinosaurs eggs, so no omelets for breakfast this morning, like that 
that's a that's a mistake right an accident that type of thing but like they knew it was wrong they knew the dangers i'm sure it's you know very easily or clearly described as to why you don't leave it and they they actively chose to do it anyway so it's like do you still just say what'd you learn from breaking the rules and move on with it you know i mean that's a great question because then the other part of that that i would also question is like how many times have they done this before and it's been perfectly fine so that creates that social license where it's like, oh, this is tolerated here, right? That it is accepted here. You are you going to go against that now? Why wasn't it a problem before? It's a problem now because you know you have more resources allocated towards it. But you know, we see that one-on-one -on -one conversation that Taylor has with Sky later, where he's just kind of asking questions around it, but you could tell that there was still like a, you know. Oh, here's what happened. Like, here's what we did. We were drinking, you know, we were doing these different things. So, but again, he'd created that relationship where she was going to tell him these other things. I think there's also an element of, I hate to say this, it's an age thing where it's not the certain generation, like I'm not like, oh, certain generation, those lovable scamps. Not that at all. It's a professional maturity thing where it's like somebody at their beginning of their career, they're going to make different types of mistakes. Somebody who's just younger. And it's not and now. If Commander Taylor's doing that, that's a completely different story. He's wildly, like, wildly, wildly inappropriate versus some young people who are exploring boundaries and stuff like that. And I think Commander Taylor also has this experience of people leaving the colony in general with the sixes. So he's like, people make their choices. That's humanity. If we wanted to bring everybody here to control them, that's not a utopian society. That's not a society at all. Like I said, that's a prison system. But I also see your perspective on if someone is consistently endangering the bottom line, the other people in the organization, should something be done about that? Yes, but it's getting fired. It's not necessarily being punished and then asked to stay. Yeah, I guess that's a good point, too. If you're pun uh, firing seems so mean, though. Ooh, a little aggressive. <laughs> Did you have anything else from this episode that stood out to you? Ah. Uh not not really uh when they're heading back towards the base uh commander taylor right tries to distract some of those razorbacks and he's just like out there and he's just like come at me bro i right he really i that just uh again dinosaurs chasing a leader i think for any human being you should probably get out of the way of the dinosaur i did think that it was interesting because it showed uh it's not just the people within the within like Terra Nova, right within the camp. It's the camp itself, right? That he he's built it. He he's passionate about it. He wants to defend it. He believes in it being sort of the right answer, and he believes in the effort that was put into it. So I it's I think it's a leadership trait, but it's I, I don't think it is a. I just saw it like okay, so this guy's really into this place and these people. Got it. So that was very very obvious to me in that moment. It was beforehand, but the fact he was willing to put his life out there, you know, for yeah. things and people, but, you know. And I'm not saying people should do this for whatever organization they work for. <laughs> Don't put oh, your life yeah. on the line, certainly. Yeah. But you brought up a really great point, and that's this founder's mindset. Like, yes, Taylor came through on the first pilgrimage. He literally has been there since the beginning. He has built or been a part of building every single part. So he's attached to the physical place. He's attached to the vision and the future that it represents, and he's attached to the people within. So I think a lot of times people don't have a founder's mindset and they don't have to like, but then there are some people who they're like, no, like I, I care, like by virtue of you being part of this company, I care about you by virtue of this being an aspect of our job. I care about it by, you know, and so some people, and it's not good, bad, or indifferent. It's just a certain personality type that is that founder's mindset of, this is mine and I want it to be successful. I'm not attached to it in a really weird way, but I want this to be successful, whatever that looks like. And so I like that you brought that up because, yeah, I think Commander Taylor expresses that very well, whether he's not calling people out and making them feel psychologically safe, whether he's physically fighting with a dinosaur <laughs> or, you know, negotiating with outside uh, opposing groups, like whatever it is. 
he stands for Terra Nova. Um, yeah. Awesome. Okay. 